My co-founder, Tim, and I started the company with this insight that there's really a better way to solve transportation for cities if you have autonomous technology. That's the key, though. You do need the autonomous technology. Because right now, we either have people driving their own cars, and that's incredibly inefficient from an economic and environmental perspective because people actually only use their cars about 4% of the time. So very wasteful use of resources. Uh, or you can use Uber and Lyft, which is sort of a better use of the car part, but then you have to pay somebody else to drive you around all the time. And that's very expensive and not very efficient as well when you think about it from that perspective. So really the only solution here is to have true autonomy and then create a fleet of robo-taxis which can drive people around all day and all night long. And so we were very determined when we started the company in 2014 to actually build this thing and get it on roads. And so that focus has helped us make in some ways more progress than maybe some other companies in the space that have had a little bit more meandering journeys uh, to where they're trying to get. One of the things that I think my position has evolved on a bit since maybe the early days, let's say 2014, 2015, is um, I no longer believe that the sort of autonomy in a box idea is going to happen anytime soon. And this autonomy in a box is this idea that you know a company can basically sell you a box where you plug in some sensors and, and it's a computer and you put some software on it and then it just magically turns a car autonomous. This is what all the OEMs want, by the way. They want somebody to save them. They want they want somebody to be like, hey, you know what, here's your here's your magic and, it, and your car is now self-driving. Um, I just don't think that's happening. Um, and, I, you know, I would have thought five or six years ago, maybe it's not that hard. Maybe there'll be a bunch of companies that figure out, you know, how to do this. But what we've learned is the problem is so hard and you need so much data and the specific sensor and computer and platform integration is so important to get right that if you don't really kind of have this integrated end-to-end -end approach, I don't think you're going to see full self-driving, you know, on, on regular cars for, for quite a long time. And, you know, going along with that, uh, and, you know, I'm a little bit biased, which, you know, I'll admit, but I do think we're going to see more and more companies realizing that an integrated approach is the best way to solve autonomous driving. And we have started to see that in the industry. In, in the beginning of Zooks, people thought we were nuts. I mean, as I said, they were like, why the hell are you making a car? That's the worst idea I've ever heard. Cars are expensive. You don't know what you're doing. Um, and, you know, slowly, one at a time, companies are saying, oh, okay, well, actually, there are a lot of reasons why cars as they were conceived for human drivers aren't the right structure and architecture and product and economic model for the future of robo taxis. And so I do think we'll see, you know, every year more and more companies realize that that integrated approach is the best way to solve the problem. And so we're excited to see what other companies come out with. And, you know, there's not one magic size fits all. I mean, we're really excited about our product and it's going to do great things for a lot of people. But, you know, the world does need different takes on this problem. And, you know, again, as a society losing 40,000 Americans every year to car crashes, uh, we can't be the only one working on this. So we're very happy that there are a bunch of different approaches. And even if they eventually converge to something that's a little bit more like what we're doing, it's a good thing that, you know, so many smart people are working on this uh, all over the country and all over the world. So we actually have several techniques to, to tackle that question because it's so important and we don't think there's any one answer that's good enough all by itself. So one technique is we can take any log file we've ever collected and then we can instantiate it as a new simulation. It's, it's more important that you can generate a new simulation than you can simply replay the log. Because remember, when you have a log file, the good news is it's real sensor data. The bad news is it's things that already happen. And so, you know, if your new software would have done something different, then it kind of invalidates all the future sensor data from the moment you would see a different behavior. So what we can do is we can take our log file and then we can instantiate all the agents in the scene as smart agents. So we can pick a point in time and say, okay, from this point on, instead of replaying the actual sensor data, let's generate new data as if we were in a dynamic scene and all the agents were reacting to whatever our new behavior is. So that's a very, very powerful technique. And it allows us to take corner cases we've seen in the past and still make them useful in the future. Another thing we can do is we can procedurally generate scenarios. So we can basically have the computer come up with difficult corner case scenarios itself, and then we can see how we handle them. And yet another thing we can do is we can manually create scenarios. So we can say, okay, you know, 
let's think of some of the most difficult things we might ever encounter in real life, even things that we hope we never see, but we can dream them up and we can think about them. And then we can actually, with our scenario editor, we can go create that scene in a semi-automated way, and then we can see how it does. So all of these techniques we use in parallel to validate our software on all the different kinds of edge cases. Um, one of the things that's hardest is when objects pop out behind other objects because you don't have very much time to react. So one of the things we can do in simulation is, you know, we can basically instantiate pedestrians jumping out or running from behind objects at the last second, and then you can see what you would do. And again, these are tests that you don't really want to run in real life because, you know, at the extreme limits, there's not even time physically to steer or to break. Uh, and so you really only want to be testing these things in simulation and seeing how close to perfection you can get. So that's one category. And then, you know, another category is creating, you know, we have a team of, of 3D technical artists and they can create digital assets. And so they'll create objects that, you know, are kind of weird and that maybe our machine learning classifiers don't know what they are. And one of the important parts of our approach is we don't rely on any single modality to be safe. It's incredibly dangerous to say, oh, we're only going to use vision or we're only going to use LIDAR because every single modality has possible failure modes. And one of the great things about 3D simulation is, you know, you can simulate how your camera responds to data or how your or LIDAR or your radar. And even if one or two of those modalities gets confused or doesn't know what something is, because we have active sensing, we always know where things are in 3D and what shape they are, and we can always track them. And so even if we manage to fool our AI semantic engine, we still can guarantee that we're not going to actually run into something if it's physically there in front of us. That's very important. The hard stuff is still largely in front of us because we have to make it significantly safer than humans in dense urban environments. That's really the holy grail of our industry is getting a custom robo taxi designed for riders into cities on public roads and being able to say you know what this this vehicle and this service is significantly safer than human drivers and so that's really what the entire company is focused on right now is you know validating it improving the software uh, quantifying the safety right because it's not enough just to think it's safe enough you really have to be able to build a comprehensive quantitative full safety argument and so we're simultaneously improving our tools and, and frameworks to, to quantify how safe it is, while at the same time actually making it safer. And those two things are converging, and when they do, uh, and when that safety level is enough better than humans that it meets our internal targets, we'll be able to release this to the world. On the simulation side, there's a few different vectors. So one of them is making the simulations more and more realistic. And that can mean you know, more accurate noise models for how sensors actually capture data from the real world. Um, it could mean more uh, accurate 3D representations of the world. I think one of the really interesting research areas, and this is something that we're starting to work on, but you know, we'd love to do more of in the future, is how do you take all of your real world sensor data and then construct 3D versions of the world that are as close to possible as what your sensors saw in a way that's still kind of computationally efficient and tractable to simulate. So in other words, instead of you know trillions and trillions of individual voxels, which would be way too much data and way too slow, can you kind of procedurally instantiate buildings and trees and traffic lights that are kind of you know as similar as possible to what's in the real world, but still efficient enough to store and to re-render. And so that's a really interesting area of research that we've really started working on, and it's super exciting, but I think there's still a ton more to do. Uh, another vector is making the simulations more scalable, so you can run more and more of them at the same time. Uh, we do a lot of work on GPU packing, so we can do multiple simulations on one GPU. Uh, and then yet another is creating more realistic agent behaviors, including those corner cases. So you want to be able to simulate normal behavior, um, but you also want to be able to simulate strange behavior that you're probably not going to see. But if you do see, you still want to be able to handle it. And so we also have a team working on agent behaviors. And it's really interesting how that connects with prediction, because there's a tight link between how you simulate other agents and how our own vehicle predicts that other agents in the scene will react. And really, we didn't even have deep learning 15 years ago. And what's interesting, I think, about the deep learning revolution is not just the fact that there's entirely new categories of algorithms. And yes, some of the precursor ideas were around 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but really, deep learning came into its own starting, you know, 20 everything else. And 
in order for that really to get unlocked, though, you needed new hardware, right? You needed GPUs. Uh, now you have tensor cores. And it's really, it's not just the algorithm, right? It's the hardware that you run the algorithms on. And so, you know, working with NVIDIA, for example, that's allowed us to get a couple orders of magnitude more computation done in the same amount of power just over the last decade. And that makes all the difference because you have to run these algorithms at high resolutions and high frame rates and multiple cameras at the same time. Then you have to fuse all that together. And so if you didn't have that sort of multi-generational advance in hardware along with the algorithms, we wouldn't be able to do any of this in real life. We could maybe write a, a research paper and say, hey, this is, you know, here's this algorithm. But again, if you can't run that in real time on an actual vehicle, it doesn't really solve any problem. Uh, we've built our own supercomputer at Zoox. We have mm, almost 3,000 GPUs in it now, which I know is not the biggest supercomputer in the world, but for a self-driving car company, it's, it's no joke. And so all of our developers get to use the supercomputer to run their distributed tasks. And it's pretty easy. You basically push a metaphorical button and then you know your task gets run on tens or hundreds or even thousands of GPUs, depending on what the task is. And so we're able to train these really complex models on lots and lots of data very, very quickly. I mean, you know, a decade ago, you could train a deep neural net and it wasn't a very good one and you might take several weeks to train it. And now you can train vastly more sophisticated nets with way more data and you can do that in a matter of hours. Uh, having symmetrical carriage seating, which is such a nicer atmosphere to be in than getting shoved in the back seat of an Uber or Lyft if you're in the regular passenger car. Um, it's things like the safety features. We have so many safety innovations in our vehicle, not only on the AI side, when that's super important, but also on the passive side, because no matter how good your AI is, you can't guarantee that nobody else will run into you. And so if that happens, you want to be as safe as possible. So passenger cars, actually, they only get five-star crash safety ratings, even when they do. That's only for the front seats. It's not nearly as safe in the back. Because we're symmetrical, we get the same crash ratings on either end, because we don't have a front or back. It's just the same thing. So that's another big difference. We can put way more redundancy in there. We can have a much bigger battery, so we can drive all day night and all night long on one charge. Uh, we can make it really comfortable. We can make it have plenty of room. Uh, and then we can do things like four-wheel steering, and we can do bi-directionality. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. And lastly, because it's a new shape of a vehicle, we can put the sensors exactly where you want them for the best possible fields of view on all the corners. And that makes the AI a lot safer as well.